Hello, this is K.L. Kandek, and I head up marketing here at Mokana. Thank you for joining our webinar today. Today we'll be talking about protecting IoT endpoint devices uh, with Mokana TrustPoint. So we'll be getting into a bit of detail on what we do and how to leverage Mokana. Um, and specifically, we'll be talking about securing the boot process. So this is the first in a series of three webinars where we'll be talking about different aspects of hardening and protecting endpoint devices. So this means that we're, we'll, uh, uh, we'll be going through things such as uh, securing the boot process, authentication and um, uh, identity uh, management, and also communications. So with me today I have Srinivas Kumar. Welcome, Srinivas. Uh, hello, everyone. Yes, and uh, Srinivas is our VP of Engineering. Uh, he is a, an expert in the field of cybersecurity and cryptography, holds patents uh, within the area. I think, I don't know, something crazy like 20-something. Um, but uh, also um, uh, someone who understands all of this well and, and will uh, we'll be going through this today. So as a backdrop, uh, I think we all know that that the uh, cyber attacks are simply escalating. Um, even this year, we've seen things like our electric grid under attack, um, as well as uh, the impact of uh, WannaCry and NotPetya uh, continuing to impact industrial sectors, and also things like the Triconix attacks um, uh, uh, for safety instrumented systems that have impacted industrial environments. So. Um, when we look at what's going on, I think a lot of it comes back down to many of these connected devices simply are not secure. Um, for example, you know, think of a, an uh, oil and gas refinery. Uh, you have several DCS systems that may be um, uh, controlling turbines or furnaces or, um, uh, or condensers. And if these are compromised, they pose great risks to safety, uh, personnel safety, reliability and uptime of the system, as well as the environment. And um, when we look deeper into the problem, um, it's not necessarily any particular vulnerability uh, that seems to be the problem. It's that the hackers are having quite an easy time accessing the devices to begin with. And this is because they can get behind firewalls, uh, bypass gateways and data diodes, jump air gaps, as we saw with Stuxnet, um, and avoid physical uh, or, uh, or get into networks by physically compromising environments. Uh, oftentimes, climbing fences, getting into walls, breaking into um, uh, uh, poorly secured devices or coming in via the network. And the reason this is happening is because these devices tend to have very little security today, sometimes a little more than password authentication. So they lack physical security or protection within a data center, for example. Uh, the keys on the device may be held insecurely. Um, uh, in a, uh, it, it may not have, especially legacy devices, it may not have anything protecting the boot process, and, um, and authentication may be either a role-based access or simple password authentication. And oftentimes, these legacy devices are using old industrial protocols that are insecure. So um, uh, a lot of it comes back to these devices lacking what we believe is essential security, right? We've got to fix the security on the devices. Um, thankfully, the Industrial Internet Consortium has tried to make this a simpler uh, process by looking at um, uh, requirements or what they believe are requirements to implement security to meet different security levels. So IEC 62443 uh, uh, security level 2, 3, and 4 are the top levels of security. Um, uh, and they map fairly closely to FISMA low, medium, and high on the NIST standard side. 
uh, they've written a report that defines security requirements for these different levels, and it's available free for download at this URL on this page. But you can just go to their website or search endpoint security best practices, and uh, you should be able to find it free for download. Um, so I think this is a useful way for us to look at one of the basic aspects of if you're building uh, or upgrading your uh, industrial automation devices um, or an IoT device, what should you be thinking about? Um, uh, we'll talk about this in some of the upcoming slides about a root of trust, the role of a secure boot process, the role of uh, 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 endpoint identities and crypto, cryptographic services, and also secure communications. So let's dive into that. Maybe Srinivas, can you talk a bit about um, kind of these different levels and some of the basic elements uh, that are within the um, endpoint security best practices uh, requirements and document? Oh, sure, so the IIC proposes a gradual ramp up from basic to enhanced to critical depending on the requirements and functions of devices. Not all devices are born equal, but uh, given that you need to start somewhere, the basic model of security starts with a root of trust that is a means to get an immutable endpoint identity. And through that identity, be able to certify that device as an authentic device and uh, perform secure communications for data transport with secure cryptographic services. And an essential, essential part of the basic the device uh, posture is to have secure boot. And then you go to the advanced level where you would require a higher degree of endpoint management on a smarter device, maybe an edge gateway, a grade of device that would allow for remote configuration and remote lifecycle management of that entire device stack. And finally, it will get to the critical assurance level where you need checks and balances, you need monitoring, uh, be able to certify or attest that that device is operating as expected. Uh, moving to a OT model of uh, what IT used to call SimSAM, where this has to be essentially a bandwidth a limited resource constraint device that has to efficiently report its health. Great. Um, let's see, so diving into that a bit more, let's go into this notion of basic security. You know, um, obviously we have many legacy devices that were built a long time ago, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, and that represents a big challenge for companies to, to upgrade. But for companies that are building new devices or looking at, at uh, what they should be focused on to build secure devices at a very basic level, um, can you go into uh, the, the roles of these a, a, a bit more um, and what, what they might entail? Sure, so when you start at the very basic level, the most es essential component out of the box is secure boot. And you see that uh, here in this uh, diagram where it is uh, based on a secure element that establishes a root of trust and then you do your secure boot. Now, how do you achieve that today in a legacy device? Typically it is done with a, s a software or firmware based root of trust in the form of a boot ROM. So the boot ROM is uh, burnt in at the factory, expected to be a constant. It has some cryptographic keys baked in. And then it verifies every subsequent stage of the boot process through signature verification. So that does give you an entry point posture. But where uh, Mokana is going on this is to go to the next level of secure boot to the cyber boot level. And here, what we are doing is raising the bar to being able to harden that device with not just a single factory fuse them key, but with multiple keys. And we'll talk more about that later in this presentation to make that device more hacker-proof, more uh, easier to recover in the case of a key compromise. 
And that is still at the basic level. So essentially taking the legacy devices and aftermarket being able to harden that device to bring it to a cyber boot posture. Great. Um, and um, you know, when we look at, at Mokana and what we provide, Mokana provides um, uh, software that can be implemented on these devices. So we help manufacturers to improve and harden their devices and also secure their supply chain uh, with other automation uh, services and tools. Um, for this in particular, what we are going to talk about is the role of uh, our Secure Our Cyber Boot um, and uh, how it can help to harden the device, secure the, uh, the boot process. And then we'll talk a bit about how that um, can chain and be used in conjunction with the other uh, 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 the other aspects of what our solution can do, including securing communications across SSL, IPsec, multicast wireless, um, uh, um, uh, how it can interact with creating a more secure authentication uh, system, and how we can secure updates. But today we're going to focus on boot. So um, let's, uh, let's dive in there. There are a couple of different types of ways of looking at the boot process. And one of them are, um, uh, well, actually, let's just start. What is, what, can you describe this notion of secure boot? What is it? Um, how would you describe it and what are the approaches? All right, so secure boot, as defined by uh, industry jargon today, comes in a couple of flavors. Uh, one is verified boot, where every stage of the boot can measure and verify the next stage of boot before it passes control to that image as part of the boot sequence. So this is uh, what is called verified boot. Now, if you fail to verify the next stage of the image, you have to make a go, no-go decision on whether you're going to stop the boot process or you're going to switch to a recovery partition. And if you do uh, jump to a recovery partition, then there is a process to mitigate and uh, recover the device. So that's the uh, verified boot. The next one is measured boot. In measured boot, you actually take measurements typically using something like a TPM. So you can attest to the boot process after the fact that the device has powered on and booted so that remotely you can verify that the measurements are as expected. So it, it gives you a higher degree of assurance that not only was a verified boot uh, happening on the device, but you can actually attest to it at any point in time. Uh, this is basically where we are, the industry is today. Uh, where Mokana goes is taking it to the next level based on the limitations of Secure Boot. So here are the challenges that uh, one faces with uh, Secure Boot mechanisms today. Uh, firstly, you have uh, typically a vendor lock-in. The key that is burnt in is either supplied by the silicon vendor or the OEM. And so that uh, is a one-way journey in terms of how do you manage the life cycle of that key in the field. Uh, second, secondly, the, the key algorithms used are pretty much outdated. As newer algorithms are uh, introduced into the market and some of the older algorithms, uh, like RSA uh, 1024 keys, are known to be compromisable, uh, you, are st you are stuck with a device that has a weak posture. Uh, there is also uh, incomplete security in terms of a full boot sequence. Uh, going all the way, not just from bootloader to the operating system, but down to the configuration uh, and the system data and so on. So you have to verify a lot more application images because you cannot simply stop at the OS level. And then there is the process. The manual process is involved, getting technicians to the field for a, a, a one-touch uh, or multi-touch remediation. And then finally, the lack of trust chaining. There is no concept of supply chain provenance in this process. The key was baked in by the manufacturer. However, there is no way to ascertain throughout the supply chain from silicon vendor to OEM, the distributor to the end user, that there was no tampering. Okay. Great. Um, 
let's talk a bit about the way we we uh, think about cyber boot and our um, and securing the, the the various stages of the boot process. Maybe you can go through first kind of what happens when a device boots up, and then talk about some of the vulnerabilities during that process of how hackers can interrupt it and compromise the device. Can you talk about that? Sure. Uh, the normal process uh, in the boot is uh, when you power on the device, the device starts executing from its first instruction in a boot ROM, which is typically uh, calling a first stage bootloader. The first stage bootloader is typically provided by the silicon vendor, and what it does essentially is verify that the second stage bootloader which is called the secondary bootloader. Uh, and that can be a third party bootloader like U-Boot or Kinetix or Little Kernel and so on, uh, has not been tampered. So those bootloaders are signed and the verification happens. And then it's up to the bootloader to verify the, the operating system, the kernel, that will uh, come up based on the partition that is used to boot. And once that happens, uh, you establish a implicit trust in the platform and let the applications run on that platform. So that's what uh, is platform level trust. It's not really an entire full stack device trust, but a platform trust. Uh, the, the, the downside being that the signature of the second stage bootloader is a one-time signature burnt in at the factory. Uh, now what Cyberboot does is introduces a multi-stage bootloader into this boot sequence in a way that the first stage bootloader would be signed with a golden key of uh, whoever the silicon vendor is, or in the case of UFI, it could be Microsoft, and passes control to the multi-stage bootloader, which allows a stamping mechanism to have multiple keys and ending and ordering of keys to verify subsequent images. So there is no one key compromise that can um, subvert the device or break the device. And it's highly flexible, it is configurable, and you can change the configuration on the fly. So what the multi-stage bootloader does is it does a forward verification of the components in the boot chain based on a variety of key algorithms, number of keys, and a variable set of keys, which makes it a lot more difficult for even a professional hacker to crack all these keys. Now that, that's basically how we strengthen that boot process all the way not just to the OS kernel, but you could actually do a forward verification of applications sitting on a file system. So, so that means as, as the device boots up, um, as it's loading from the first stage of the bootloader all the way up to loading the kernel, the OS, the applications, you can actually do a forward verification and verify that everything that's loading, uh, the applications included, uh, all are as they should be, right? So this is different than verifying data at rest on the device. This is really looking at are the applications and the operating system itself, um, have they all booted up uh, according to what we expect that device to um, uh, have on it? Right. right, so this actually gives you the granular control of verifying the configuration, for example, system configuration, firewall configuration, uh, key stores, certificate stores, all of them are intact before you pass control. And then, and then being able to use all of those measurements and have certificates for each of those enables you to create, uh, um, I mean, a hacker would need to be able to get through a, a, a ton on that device to, uh, to compromise it, break through, um, or they'd have to compromise all of those certificates, not just one. Right. And this is something that Mukana's uh, Cyberboot achieves with very minimal runtime overhead. We, we can operate in the order of milliseconds to verify the image. Right. And I think this gets right to the heart of, at least from a, a boot perspective, um, you know, some companies will either say they, they've secured the boot process or hidden a, some sort of key uh, within the, uh, the boot ROM uh, or somewhere uh, on the device in flash. But if that one key is compromised, uh, you can get access to that device. Right. So a single key compromise or uh, let's say you use a RSA key and 
RFA1024 algorithm is uh, known to be compromised. Uh, then you have a situation on your hands in terms of rapid remediation of the devices in the field that are now got a serious exposure. Great. Okay. And we will uh, open this up at the end for questions. Uh, but if you do have a question, feel free to submit that uh, via the um, uh, chat uh, screen um, on the, um, uh, in the, the Bright Talk webinar here. So, okay. So, that's great, right? Mokana can work with you. The boot process or software can help device developers to um, implement a much stronger uh, and secure uh, device. How does it work? Step us through, if you want to work with Mokana, how would you use our software or solution? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, we provide uh, a framework for application developers where you can uh, start with the source code or in certain cases with a binary. Uh, if you start with the source code, you compile it into your solution. Uh, we, you, we can transition you from open source like an open SSL or embed TLS to our stack without any code modifications. Uh, you basically compile this. You can use our APIs. We provide a hierarchy of APIs at different functional levels from transport to uh, authentication to trust anchor uh, usage and so on. So they're very layered. You can pick and choose the APIs that you need. And then you compile that into your solution and, and then run that binary on your target operating environment. Uh, we support uh, over 30 operating systems uh, all the way from the Linux variants, Windows variants to RTOSes across uh, 70 plus chipsets where you might want to leverage a hardware acceleration uh, on the chipset uh, you could leverage uh, a lot more secure element functionality on the chipset, and all of that is possible by simply calling our APIs. Uh, if you move your application from one target operating environment to another, or you want your application to work across multiple target operating environments across your family of devices, you don't have to rewrite your applications, you just compile them. Great, sounds pretty simple. Um, uh, let's see. So, kind of summing some of this up in terms of the advantages of this. Um, how would, tell us about some of the advantages of this uh, of our cyber boot solution. Well, firstly, we take you away from a vendor lock-in where the golden boot keys are not owned by a silicon vendor or OEM. Your device management service has full control over it. So, there's a privacy of your boot keys, and you control its destiny. Uh, Mokana provides a FIPS 140-2 level 1 certified crypto engine. So all the cryptography that we do for uh, the signature verification goes through FIPS lab certification. So we, are, uh, we do very rigorous testing uh, to make sure there's no vulnerabilities in the algorithms and the implementations. Uh, we do integrate with hardware-based root of trust. And we, we do the verification of multi full stages of the boot process. So there are, there are no gaps. It can go all the way to your configuration, uh, system level configuration, firewall level configuration, and so on. Uh, we provide a trust chaining through the supply chain provenance. So uh, every stage of that boot process, the bootloader, the OS kernel, the applications, might have originated from different suppliers. Being able to use different sets of keys, tying it to different suppliers gives you a stronger trust chain because it's not uh, very common to have a monolithic image where one entity takes responsibility for the entire software stack. So we allow for that type of trust chaining. So this is very different than a lot of just simple uh, single platform based uh, secure boot implementation which is just kind of taking you through the first stage of the, the boot process, right? So you could in fact implement those um, and have someone um, uh, get through that, but compromise um, other 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 uh, compromise the de device previously. For example, uh, load something into Flash that is pointing to an application that should be loaded, and the system would go through it and uh, load that that malware. Right. Um, what you're saying is with 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 
uh, by securing the multiple stages of the boot process, as well as trust chaining it up into the application and the OS, you can really minimize the amount of vulnerabilities as that device gets fully um, uh, powered on. Right. So uh, if you use a single key, then you have a component level compromise that can happen through different attack vectors. Uh, 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 as an example, a set-top box could be compromised by tampering with the configuration on it, not necessarily the operating system or the bootloader. And that could do significant revenue damage to your product. So a single key is a ticking time bomb in terms of a very small component in your device that can get compromised. So it's like using a single key for house, your car, uh, for everything. Uh, if that key is compromised, you have multiple assets that can be compromised. Mm -hmm. How about some of these other, other uh, uh, items? Yeah, so uh, the other items are also driven by compliance requirements, where how do you prove to your customer that you have tamper resistance? Uh, is the tamper resistance across the supply chain? Uh, could some, a single uh, contractor or a third-party vendor introduce a vulnerability? So that's really where our supply chain comes in. The, the second uh, uh, important factor is now at what stage can your boot process be interrupted by a hacker? At the bootloader level, at the OS level, at the application level, and so on. Uh, you also want to prevent the boot uh, process to be uh, tampered with um, through media, whether it's a USB stick or something that with physical access can tamper with your device, not just over the network. Uh, you want to also have the trust chaining that can prove that the device is trustworthy based on the full stack uh, validation mm -hmm. uh, so that establishes the multi-vendor uh, notion of if I just get a firmware update today from a silicon vendor, I get an OS update tomorrow from an OS vendor, that the state and integrity of the sum of the components is, is still at a stable. And you can do this uh, using our development framework, uh, which uh, gives you all the APIs for attestation, for code, for remote uh, monitoring, and so on. Great. OK. Um, yeah, let's get into that a bit. Just kind of, uh, you know, we talked a lot about boot, uh, the role of it in um, uh, devices vulnerability, and also the different ways you can think about uh, verifying the boot process or measuring it and also our approach uh, to what we call cyber boot and the advantages of it. So let's now kind of frame it within the context of um, Mokana and, and, and kind of the broader set of solutions uh, uh, that our customers can work with. So Mokana is uh, was founded in 2002 uh, as an embedded security software provider, primarily for the military. So we build embedded security uh, uh, software to protect avionics devices, make them tamper-proof, uh, and they're, they're implemented currently in everything from tanks to avionics on jet airplanes, drones, etc. We also have used that to secure uh, a variety of different industrial devices. Today we have several hundred customers, most of them large industrial OEMs and uh, avionics uh, suppliers and contractors, and we're protecting more than 100 million devices today. Um, we do this in a way that is uh, that goes beyond what we just talked about, which is uh, protecting a simply a, a device uh, by addressing the full end-to-end -end security lifecycle. So when you think of managing security across a device, what are you doing from a development perspective to incorporate both hardware and software-based security? Um, during the manufacturing process, how do you protect the onboarding and enrollment of that device? How do you scale it? How do you protect from man in the middle of man in the middle attacks or um, uh, a hacker compromising or stealing a key uh, during the manufacturing process or shipment? And then also, how do you make it easy for customers that are buying and using the devices to enroll, them, enroll their own digital certificates on that device as well? And then finally, how do you look at managing uh, the updates on the device, 
uh, managing security all the way through to uh, revocation of certs um, and also transfer of ownership of a device or end of life. So we provide the solutions in all of these areas, principally in, um, uh, through uh, uh, two primary solutions. One is TrustPoint. That is the endpoint IoT or the IoT endpoint security software uh, of which Cyberboot is a part. And also Trust Center, which is a server-based uh, uh, platform that allows you to manage enrollment and update uh, on those devices. Uh, I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail on that, but at a high level, uh, there is software on the device, clients on the device that communicate back to Trust Center, and Trust Center on the back end is connected to a CA and domain controllers, etc. And we use uh, uh, protocols like EST to automate the authentication process, and um, uh, it's much more secure um, and it's much more scalable than what is out there today. Um, Mokana Trust Point, um, it is typically deployed on either a device or a gateway. Uh, so typically resource constrained devices or industrial uh, gateways. It's very lightweight, optimized for resource constrained devices, and it's integrated across a number of platforms. We handle, this, our uh, TrustPoint handles everything from trusted identities to trusted uh, secure boot to a uh, trusted update process. And it's all standards-based protocol, so it interoperates with uh, other devices using standards-based protocols. It's quite comprehensive, um, what we provide. I'm not going into a great detail, but um, uh, I'm going to jump ahead here. It's when you look at Mokana versus other solutions that you would have to stitch together as a cyber architect or product security engineer, um, one of the advantages about, of Mokana is we just make it simple to implement uh, a whole set of comprehensive IoT security features uh, on your devices. Um, so with that, why don't we open it up for uh, Q&A and uh, for those of you who have questions, please do send them in and um, uh, via uh, the chat. Okay, so we have one question about um, uh, how, how, how uh, cyber, how would this work on a highly resource constrained device like a sensor or something like that? Yeah, on a resource constrained device like a sensor, you would start with the amount of resources, memory resources that you have. Uh, typically, the sensor would uh, would require approximately 8 kilobytes to 14 kilobytes of memory available for us to inject our nano boot uh, solution into a boot ROM. So at that level, you can establish that the integrity of the device at power on uh, can be assured. The next level is if you have, uh, depending on the protocol, whether it's a LoRaWAN, uh, Bluetooth, uh, whatever protocol the device uses to connect to uh, an access point or a gateway, uh, we can provide device authentication with uh, some of the crypto ciphers that we can provide, like RC5, Chacha, uh, and uh, Apollo 1305, and so on, which would be the most optimum lightweight crypto cipher uh, in terms of the bandwidth it, it will take up on the, on the, in the transmission as well as the CPU and processing power on a battery constrained device. So depending on the very specifics of the sensor, we have a certain set of capabilities that will fit within a small memory form factor and provide you secure boot, which uh, provides the tamper proofing and authentication based on uh, ciphers that are acceptable even to NIST. Okay, we have another question. I have secure boot on my device today through my silicon vendor. H how does this integrate with Mokana? If you have a first stage bootloader through your silicon vendor, then we can still chain ourselves as a second stage, as what we showed as the multi-stage bootloader. 
Now this can be done without modifying the source code, the first stage bootloader provided by the silicon vendor. Now we are working with several silicon vendors in this regard because they also understand how we strengthen the boot process beyond what they can do today. And this does not require source code modification by the silicon vendor, but merely in injecting us into the uh, boot chain in a way that we can provide multi-key hardening beyond the first stage. Okay, great. Um, if you have uh, interest in learning more about uh, Mokana and how we defend against cyber attacks, uh, learning more about um, our uh, full stack solution, or would like to uh, 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 engage with us or demonstrate our technology, please go to our website, reach out to us, take a look, and uh, contact us there. You can also download several links and attachments that we'll provide uh, um, that you'll be provided at the end of this webinar. Um, you'll be sent a copy of this that you can replay, uh, and of course, all of these attachments that you see now will be, always be available. Uh, we actually have one more question to finish this up. How are you or would you assist a large healthcare provider in managing security for IoT medical devices? So a lot of these uh, I, uh, medical devices come in uh, one of two categories. Uh, you could have a low-end sensor that could be something uh, like a variable, something that uh, is on a patient. And then you have the other set of devices that could be the bigger machines like the CT scanners, X-ray, ultrasound, and so on. Uh, for the devices that have uh, monitoring, you know, patient monitoring or bedside monitoring with uh, lower resources, we would address it the same way we just described, where we could provide a, a tamper-proof uh, power-on of the device, uh, which ensures that no software in that stack was tampered and it is uh, coming from the authentic vendors. And then in terms of the data that is sent out from those type of sensors, which could be critical uh, from, a, um, from the point, uh, point of view of uh, the physicians and the doctors, the integrity of the data can be provided with signing of the data leaving the device. So the monitoring systems know that this is authentic data coming from an authentic device and has not been tampered. Great, yes. Uh, also on our website, we have a whole uh, a page dedicated to how we work with uh, medical devices. We secure a variety of medical imaging devices and other connected devices. Uh, one of the big challenges in healthcare is obviously uh, the legacy devices that are out there that need to be up upgraded, uh, some of which are um, uh, running Windows and others that are running more embedded Linux-based systems. Uh, for those, uh, we have um, uh, done things like upgraded the basic or implemented a crypto library and also um, added uh, either uh, SSH or SSL and some level of authentication that goes beyond password authentication, uh, so either key-based or certificate-based authentication. Um, so there are simple ways to update uh, existing devices in the field. Uh, and for new products being developed, um, we have a whole set of solutions of looking at everything from uh, incorporating very, you know, hardware-based secure elements like a TPM into devices and implementing much stronger security for communications as well as authentication and confidentiality. So um, uh, we do have experience in this area, and I would encourage you to, uh, to, to reach out to us, and, um, and we'd love to talk with you. So with that, we are uh, um, uh, going to conclude this webinar. Thank you for attending today, and we look forward to, to working with you, talking with you, and, uh, uh, and helping, with, helping you. Uh, thank you very much, and have a great day.